Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. I wish that I could tell you that I wish that I could tell you that we specifically scheduled LBMC's Catalyst event to coincide with National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but we didn't. With that said, it is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. October is that. And um, in 2004, the Department of Homeland Security recognized the need to raise the collective awareness of cybersecurity among Americans. And they declared that forevermore October would be National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So our topic today, why cybersecurity programs fail, is not only timely, but it's also relevant for all of us as business leaders. Just a little bit about my background. I have spent time on the consulting side for a number of years, but also spent nine years as a chief information security officer working with two large publicly traded companies and saw firsthand the challenges of having to deal with cybersecurity issues. And so for those of you who are in business leadership roles, I would ask you as we go through, just challenge yourself to think about um, are, do these issues that we're talking about, do they apply to my business? Do I, do I have a confidence that I know the answers to these? And as we get started, I've got our first question. I'd like to hear from you. How do you feel about your company's cybersecurity efforts? So if you'll go in the CVent panel, you can choose. I'm really confident. I'm somewhat confident. I'm not confident or we don't really care. And I would love to see what your perspective is as we get started. To guide our discussion today, I want to use a, a simple report card because while cybersecurity itself can be complicated and technical, um, really when we boil it down, it comes down to some simple, really some simple concepts. And there are nine things that if organizations think through these nine items and they are purposeful about them, then uh, they'll actually uh, be able to be successful in cybersecurity. And the first one has to do with information security, staffing, and management. And this is really around, do we have people at our disposal who can help us evaluate and make good decisions about cybersecurity issues? And then do we have security policies that govern how people interact with computer systems and handle data on our behalf? Do we have a way to conduct risk assessments and then a governance process to make well-informed, educated decisions about cybersecurity risk? We're going to talk a lot about system and data inventory and why, that, why that's so important. But the bottom line is you can't protect what you don't know you have. Authentication and authorization talks about how we prove who we, uh, that we are who we say we are to a computer system and then how we get the access we need in order to do our jobs, but also only the access needed for us to carry out our job duties. Configuration is how we tighten our computer systems, harden them is what we call it in cybersecurity to make sure that they're protected and secure. Vulnerability management is the, the concept of scanning and assessing our environment for weaknesses, technical weaknesses, missing patches, misconfigured systems, those types of things, and then being purposeful about fixing those configurations to make sure we're not leaving holes for hackers to exploit. Monitoring is the process of actually alerting and responding to security issues when they occur. And then the last piece, which we'll also talk a good bit about, is third parties and how third parties have such an important impact on any organization's overall security program. So as we get started, I, I thought maybe I would start today with just, um, I, I spent, um, there have been a number of security breaches. We, we, could, we could point to lots of them. Many of them probably come to mind for you, but just in, in 2021 alone, there have been some pretty significant and noteworthy security breaches. One that happened in, in uh, April, um, Facebook had another security breach. Um, it was pretty significant. Of course, any of us that use Facebook, data that Facebook collects on us is captured and used by them for marketing purposes and things like that. And some of that data was compromised. And this is on the heels of them paying what is the largest fine ever assessed by the FTC, $5 billion, billion with a B, for their previous breach. So um, Facebook is really struggling to keep data safe. All of us probably remember the Colonial Pipeline breach. And while we may not have even heard of the Colonial Pipeline before that breach, 
it had an impact on a number of people around the country because it reduced our access to gasoline for a period of time uh, because it affected the oil supply in the United States. And so, and that was a ransomware attack. And so you can see how a company who's downstream from us as consumers having a breach can have a significant impact on us as individuals. McDonald's, one of the most iconic brands in America, announced in June that it had a significant cybersecurity breach. And you may not have heard of this company, Kaseya. What's significant about Kaseya is the company itself um, wasn't necessarily breached, but Kaseya makes a technology tool that IT departments use to control and manage computer systems throughout their environment. So the hackers realized, hey, if we could figure out a way to break into that tool, we wouldn't only get Kaseya's environment, we would get every company's environment that's managed by Kaseya as well. And so that breach was significant for many organizations because that tool having a compromise in it meant that all of those organizations' systems were exposed until they were able to take the necessary measures to address that security issue. T-Mobile announced in August that they've lost the data of 53 million subscribers. And then you may not have heard of Twitch, but Twitch is an Amazon company that announced that it had a breach very recently. And what's significant about all these organizations on the screen, they're large companies. They have smart and capable security people, and they're endeavoring to do the right things. But yet, they're still struggling with cybersecurity, and they're still getting breached. And that's why I want to spend some time focusing on some key things that you can do at your organization that can help reduce the chance that your organization is one of the logos on this screen. Before we move on, there's one more I wanted to mention, which is a heartbreaking situation if you haven't heard of it. This is one of the very first times where human life has actually been tied potentially to a cybersecurity issue. In 2019, there was a hospital in Alabama that suffered a ransomware attack. Many of you may work at organizations who've had to deal with ransomware. It's a difficult challenge. And as a part of their response, their IT department made the decision that they needed to take their systems offline for a period of time to try to minimize the spread of the ransomware. And that's a common response that organizations often take when they think there's a virus in their environment. However, while the systems were offline, the medical devices that needed the network connections were unable to function properly. And there was a mother that came into the hospital to give birth. <clears throat> and because they did not have access to fetal monitors, the doctor was unable to recognize that the, that the uh, infant actually had the umbilical cord wrapped around its neck. And so it was born with a, a number of complications and ultimately passed away. And so uh, just recently, just a couple of months ago, the family has brought a lawsuit against the hospital and they're tying the infant's death to the fact that there were the medical technology wasn't available because the doctor had said, hey, if I had had this device, I would have been able to detect that the umbilical cord was wrapped around the neck and likely would have taken different steps during the delivery. So um, this is a situation worth keeping eyes on, but heartbreaking it, it, to know that this could have potentially uh, impacted human life. So with just those examples there, it seems like we're almost setting out the welcome mat for criminals and making it easy. Um, well, of course, we're not intending to do that, uh, but cybersecurity isn't easy. And what I'd like to share with you today are 10 things that organizations do that sometimes leave, leaves them exposed to potential cybersecurity issues. Uh, and so what we're going to do, we're going to start by talking about, it's really important before we understand how breaches occur and what the things that we, we do sometimes that may leave us exposed to cybersecurity issues, we need to understand what the bad guys are after. And in the old days, the bad guys were simply after a computer system. They were scanning, looking for a system they could take control of. These days, they don't do that nearly as much because there are freely available systems in the cloud and things like that, they have access to plenty of computing power. Um, so they don't need that as often, but what they're after is data. They're after information that they can monetize or they can use for nefarious purposes. And so any conversation on cybersecurity needs to start with an understanding of sensitive data. So we'll start there. 
Um, then I want to share some weaknesses that organizations often have that leads them exposed to security issues. But before we finish up, we'll have an action plan. All right. So as I said, as we go through, I would encourage you, maybe make some notes on your on the paper beside your desk to say, hey, uh, you know, as, as these questions come up, do I feel like my organization is potentially falling victim to some of these traps? And if so, you can go back and be a catalyst for change in your organization. So let's stop making it easy. OK, there are several types of sensitive data that we need to be thoughtful about. Um, so because we need to understand that's what the bad guys are after. The first type of sensitive data we know is personally identifiable information. Now, that's information about you and me that we wouldn't want other people to know about us. OK, and uh, there's a lot of examples there on the screen, our social security numbers. Obviously, we would like for those to be private. Um, the sad fact of it is, by this point, many people's social security numbers, including mine, are available on the dark web um, just due to prior compromises that have occurred. But there is personal information that organizations have on you and I that we want them to keep private. As a matter of fact, when we gave it to them, there was an in inherent implicit expectation they would take steps to keep it private. The second type of data that uh, or that the bad guys are after is protected health information. Now, this is the data we all know is the HIPAA data. And so, you know, when you go to your doctor and they hand you that photocopied piece of paper, it's been photocopied so many times, it's hard to read and it's crooked on the page, but they ask you to sign it and it's their HIPAA disclosure. And um, what they're doing is taking one step to comply with a, a HIPAA security rule, but protected health information is information about us and a malady. So something that can be tied together um, that would give the, uh, the person who possesses that information, information about a particular affliction or a medical condition or a treatment that someone is undergoing. And, and that data is useful to an attacker. The third type of data, which is probably pretty obvious data for most of us, is credit card data. And obviously, uh, credit card data has been useful for years. And many of us can remember the time before electronic credit cards when they still had the credit card scanners and they printed out the uh, on the paper and you had the little throwaway film in between and it got all over your fingers and things like that. And thank goodness we've moved beyond that. But um, credit card data is still useful to an attacker. And so that's some of the type of data they're looking for. And then this fourth type of data, those first three are probably obvious, probably in your organization, um, you've thought through that, uh, hopefully, and said, yeah, we have that type of data and we know we need to protect it. But the fourth type of data you may not have thought about is proprietary data. This is data that gives your organization a competitive advantage. It's stuff that's unique to you. It's the secret sauce, the Coca-Cola secret formula, anything that you feel like if it were compromised could potentially reduce your ability to compete in whatever business you operate. Trade secrets, those types of things. So all this type of data is useful to an attacker. And we've got to be mindful of not only what we have, but where it is in our organizations. So as we move on, I'd love to get some feedback from you on this next question. How often do you think about security breaches? How often do you worry about security breaches in your organization? So you've got four options on the screen there, everything from, man, it's always on my mind to it's never on my mind and everything in between. But take just a second and in your portal, complete that poll question and share with your peers what's on your mind and how often you think about cybersecurity. While we're doing that, I want to go ahead and start looking at some of those things, some of those mistakes that organizations often make that leaves them vulnerable to cybersecurity issues. And the first one is thinking that compliance means security. And um, a lot of times organizations focus on a regulation they need to comply with, a regulation like the HIPAA security rule or the credit card security rules. Um, and they build a security program around complying with that regulation. Now, don't mishear me. Complying with regulations is really important. We, it's, a, it's a responsibility that business leaders have and that organizations need to do. The problem is rarely do those regulations go far enough to make sure that risk is effectively managed to a level the company is willing to accept. So just complying may not necessarily mean that your risk 
has been reduced to a level that as an organization, you're willing to accept. And so um, I, I like to encourage organizations, don't focus on compliance, focus on security, make those decisions to manage risks. And when you do that, when you're managing the risk to a separate level, you will by your very nature achieve compliance with whatever regulatory obligations apply to your organization. So if you think about the times you've sat in the board meetings or the management meetings, or if you're on your company's governance committee and the person representing cybersecurity has shared an update and on their dashboard, they've said, you know, we passed our last compliance audit or, you know, we're certifying that we're compliant with this. Well, that's a good first step, but you should probably ask the next question. Okay, great. Now that we know we're compliant with this, how do we know that's secure enough? And if you don't get a good answer there, it's probably worth following up and having an additional conversation. So let's use our report card and talk about those nine domains that I mentioned at the beginning. Bringing the report card down here, um, what are the things that if we're doing them well in our organization, it will help us avoid falling into this trap? Well, first of all, we've got to have information security staff and effective management in place to help that mindset, to avoid falling into the trap of a compliance mindset. Secondly, we've got to have a good governance process to educate our senior leadership about cybersecurity issues and help them make well-informed decisions about cybersecurity risks. All right, so you can see how those two elements in our report card are super important to make sure we don't fall into this trap. And then here's the next trap. And frankly, this is the single most uh, most significant way that organizations are compromised today, and that is allowing single factor authentication. Now, at this point, if you're going through CPE, it is highly unlikely that you don't know what multi-factor authentication is. I suspect that all of you as successful professionals have been trained by your organizations and have been to other CPE sessions where you've heard about the importance of multi-factor authentication. The idea of having something other than just a password to prove your identity to a computer system when you get access to that computer system, okay? That's what multi-factor authentication is. Usually that comes in the form of either a text message or, or a, a pop-up on your phone screen using an application or something like that. Um, it's, it's something that you possess or a biometric. Many of us that have Apple phones now use either our fingerprint or our face print as a biometric example of, of how we log in as well. So requiring multi-factor authentication is really important. And I wanna share with you why it's so important. There's a company that every year goes out on the internet and they make a list of the top 10 passwords that you and I use on our online websites. And you may be thinking, no, wait a second. How do they know the passwords that I use on my online websites? Well, um, when the bad guys compromise websites, one of the things they go after is a password database. And depending on the security of that website, they may be able to get that password database. But when they do, they take it, they use the username and the password. The username for an online site is typically an email address and the password, and they use it for whatever nefarious purposes and, and financial gains they're after. When they're done, they post it in an online forum on the dark web so other hackers can use it for their purposes as well. And so there's a company that goes out and actually looks at the lists of those passwords and compiles a list of the top 10 bad passwords that people use on the internet. Take just a second and think, what do you think is the number one password that people use? Now, when I ask this question in a live forum and there's people in the room, almost always they call out the word password. And the good news is that isn't number one. It used to be, now it's number four. But the number one most used password on the internet during 2020 was one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, what's interesting about that is this, this list has been published for several years and they update it every year. So you can see a lot of those are on the list every single year. Um, but look at the number two. Number two is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What's interesting about that is in 2019, that one wasn't on the top 10 list at all. It was lower down in the list. Why do you think it's moved up? Well, think about your interactions with your online sites. Many of them, when you've logged in recently, have probably told you, hey, we've updated our password standards and we, we need you to ch choose a new password that's longer or more complex or something like that. And so what these users did, because they struggle to remember all their passwords, many of us do, they just said, I'll just add 789 on the end. So um, you can see the challenge that cybersecurity professionals face 
when they're when they're dealing with folks that are struggling to remember so many passwords. Now, I know that at your organization, your organization has password rules that don't allow you to assign passwords like this. So um, it, you may be thinking, well, this doesn't really apply in this situation, but the concept does. The idea that folks are choosing passwords that are easy to remember or easy to crack leaves us vulnerable and emphasizes why it's so important to require a second factor to authenticate in case somebody guesses, obtains, or cracks our password. So what we always like to do is we like to tell people, hey, when you're choosing a good password, make it something that's easy to remember, easy for you to remember, but difficult for others to guess, okay? So that means it can't be a spouse name or uh, somebody in the family or something like that or a favorite sports team because people know that about you. So we typically, I used to, for years, I would use this as an example of the perfect password. Now, um, you may look at that and go, okay, I get how that's difficult to guess, but how is it easy to remember? Well, for me, I have two daughters and one of them's 20 and one of them's 16 now, but when they were younger, I used to sing to them every night when I put them to bed. And that's the song I would sing to them. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. So you can see that for me, that password would be easy to remember, but difficult to guess. But these days, a password of that length isn't long enough. Computing power has evolved so much that passwords like that can be cracked in a reasonable period of time. So security experts have gone to say, you know, you really need to use a password that, that's much longer or use a passphrase. And a passphrase is maybe it's a full sentence of, a, a, you know, a line of your favorite book or a line of your favorite song or three random words mashed together, rainbow, horse, clock, mashed together. Something like that of any length would, would make it very difficult to guess or crack given current computing resources. I've got one more example for you of a, of, a, of a good password now for Star Wars fans. May the force be with you. All right, so let's look at our report card. How do we avoid falling into the trap of using bad passwords? Well, first of all, we've got to have security policies that govern our password rules. Secondly, We've got to have authentication and authorization processes in place to make sure that people understand the importance of choosing good passwords. And thirdly, we've got to think about third parties that are accessing our computer systems. We want to make sure that we're enforcing the same password rules on them when they're accessing our systems and that we're holding them accountable to having strong passwords when they're taking data from us and storing it in their systems. All right, the third trap that organizations often fall into is struggling with security monitoring. Now, the good news is a computer system is programmed to notice when anything bad is happening, and that includes when it's being attacked. So it will generate a log event and say, hey, something bad's happening. Somebody should look at this. The problem is those logs are logging everything that happens. It logs keystrokes. It logs when you open an application. It logs when you log on and log off and everything else. And so oftentimes those... Hacking events are hidden like a needle in a haystack and very difficult to find. And so organizations struggle with actually going through, calling through those logs and finding the useful information like the needle in the haystack. Well, to do that these days, you can't do it with people because it's just too overwhelming and people are subject to, uh, you know, we all make mistakes. So you have to do it using automated tools. And there are automated tools like robots that will go through and they'll aggregate those logs and they'll scroll through looking for the types of things that look like security issues and they'll flag it and go, hey, a human needs to look at this. And they set it off to the side, which can then allow a human to only look at the ones that the artificial intelligence thinks are security issues. And so organizations really have to find a way to look at all that log information and have a process in place to be able to respond when their artificial intelligence capabilities tell them there might be an issue. So looking at our report card, to do that, we've got to have a system and data inventory because we've got to know all the systems that have logs so we can grab those logs and review that information. And we've got to know where the data is so we'll know how to follow it through the life cycle, through the flow of our organization, as well as when it comes into our organization and as it goes out.
And then, of course, we've got to have a monitoring program in place. That's what this is. This is security monitoring. We've got to have a, a way to actually capture, review, and, and, and then act on that log event. And to go with that, we've got to have people, right? That's where experts who are able to look at those log that log information and then make intelligent decisions about, okay, there's definitely a security event, and here's how we respond to minimize the impact to the organization and manage the uh, communications as necessary with any external parties. The fourth mistake that organizations make is thinking that data is safe when it's inside their protected network boundary. Most organizations recognize that, hey, you know, when data goes across the internet, it's probably at risk, but when it's in my, when it's on my server, when it's in my systems, it's okay. Well, think about this. Someone sits down at their desk and they create a file and as a part of that file, they import or add sensitive information on the clients to that business or the customers or patients of that business. Well, once they do that, they sync that file with one of the company's online applications as a part of their normal job duties. So now that sensitive information is stored on their local computer and in the company's online application. Well, then let's say that as a part of their, comp their computer, their computer syncs regularly to a cloud service, perhaps Dropbox or something like that for backups and things like that. And so it syncs that information to a cloud. So that single piece of data is now located in three locations. Well, then let's say that the individual uh, needs to share it with the person in the cube next to them. So they helpfully put it on a USB drive and reach around the corner and hand it to the other person so that they can take it and manipulate it. That data is now in four locations. And then let's say that the boss asks for the report. So the individual grabs the data, produces a report, email, emails it to their boss. And then lastly, let's say that that individual has had a computer hard drive that's gone bad in the past and they're sensitive to that. So they go to their favorite electronics store and they buy an external hard drive and thinking they'll be helpful, plug it in and they back up their hard drive. That single piece of data is now located in six locations. So you can see the challenge that cybersecurity professionals face when trying to protect data. They may recognize, a company may recognize the types of data that it has that are sensitive, but it may be really difficult to keep a handle on all the places that it goes as users are interacting with that data. So how do we address this issue? Well, first, we've got to have that system of data inventory. We've got to know the types of data that are sensitive in our organization. We have to know the environments where that data is stored, processed, and transmitted. We've got to have a good risk assessment process and a governance process. A risk assessment process is going to help us identify if this is an issue in our organization. And then governance is going to help us communicate with senior business leaders so that they can say, oh, we got to stop that practice or we have to change this approach or the way we're doing business. We need to make adjustments to make sure that we're not unknowingly putting the company and its stakeholders or its customers or patients or employees at risk. And then, of course, we've got to make sure we have a good way for people proving that they are who they say they are on the system and that they also only get access to what they need to do their jobs. That helps limit the amount of data that can be accessed by multiple people. And then, of course, we've got to do some security monitoring. We've got to see how that data is flowing through our organization. And if it's going somewhere that it shouldn't go, our monitoring tools could actually tell us that and help us recognize that we need to make changes in a business process or re-educate a user about how they're handling certain data to reduce the chance that it could be compromised. And then lastly, don't forget about those third parties. They've got your data as well, and they need to be held accountable to the same expectations you have for your employees. Another big mistake organizations make is thinking the IT department's got this. The IT department in most organizations doesn't own data. The business owns the data. It creates the data. The IT department is a steward that facilitates access to the data, but business has to set expectations to tell the IT team how they want the data handled and managed. And that's really important. So make sure your company hasn't fallen into the trap of pointing down to the IT department and saying, they got this, they'll take care of it. They have to work collectively with you as business leaders to understand what your expectations are. And then they can come to you and tell you what changes may need to be made, technology that may need to be purchased or, or policies that need to be adjusted in order to achieve your objectives. 
that's where having proper access to security experts can help educate you on that. Having good security policies that tell everyone that, that security is their responsibility, having good process for proving that you are who you say you are, managing your third parties as well. So all those things are really important. I said at the beginning, we can't protect what we don't know we have. If we don't have a good inventory of systems and data, there's no way we can protect it all. And many of the security breaches that you read about come, back to my reference earlier, not because the company wasn't endeavoring to try to do the right things or spending money or conducting risk assessments. It's because they didn't have their handle on everything in their environment. Maybe they had a shadow IT environment. Maybe it was a, a business unit that had a big aspirations and they didn't want to wait for IT to do something. So they spun up a different server uh, that was unknown to IT. And so it didn't have the same controls on it. Or maybe it was a recent acquisition, a company that was bought and that company hasn't yet been fully integrated and they've got stuff in the cloud that they forgot to mention as a part of their onboarding and assimilation. And so those types of things happen, but those are associated with the organization and pose a risk. There's that system and data inventory. We can't emphasize that enough. A governance process, conducting risk assessments to understand what the likelihood is that there's stuff out there we don't know about. And then, of course, those third parties that have access on our behalf. And monitoring as well. Monitoring can help here. It can help when, because it will see data, data flow across the environment. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about inventory of systems and data. So I'm curious to know, what about you? How, how confident do you feel in your organization's inventory of systems and data? Do you feel like you have a good handle on it? Are you confident that you guys know where all your data is and all your systems are? Or are you confident your company doesn't have any idea or everything in between? Take a second and complete the poll now. Another challenge that companies fall into is the thought that in many cases, organizations are driven by the need to return, uh, uh, to, to deliver a return to stakeholders. And that's understandable. A for-profit business is generally in business to make money. Well, in most organizations, cybersecurity doesn't increase revenues or reduce costs. And so when times get tough, when money's tight, a lot of times the cybersecurity efforts are the things that get pushed or crunched or set aside for later. And an organization that thinks that way actually could be hindering its ability to make money because while it's true that cybersecurity efforts aren't necessarily going to increase revenues or reduce costs, not investing in cybersecurity could likely affect the company's ability going forward, either through damaged reputation or system downtime or unavailability that prevents the, the organization from making revenue for a period of time or potentially through litigation, liability and litigation. So it's important that an organization, when it's dealing with that, think through, we've still got to be uh, resilient and steadfast about managing our risks to an acceptable level, even in the face of difficult business challenges. That's where a, a good security leader can come in, can help advise and educate management and help them think through that as well as a good governance process. That's super important because ultimately security efforts are only as good as the business leaders and the company's willingness to accept them because a savvy business leader may be able to go and just say, you know what, that doesn't apply to me. It can apply to my people, but not to me and, and ask to be have an exception granted or something like that. Well, guess who the bad guys would want to go after? They want to go after the business leaders because they typically have the most access. So making exceptions for business leaders is often the biggest mistake an organization can make because those are the ones that are targeted when organizations are under attack. We've talked about those third parties, but third parties are really, really important. Many of the breaches you read about actually originated from third parties and not from the organization itself. And so it's important to have a good inventory of those third parties that are storing, processing, or transmitting data on your behalf or that have access to systems uh, in your environment. And uh, we've got to hold them accountable. A common way to do that is to ask them to provide some sort of a third-party assurance report, like a SOC 2 report, or there are other types of third-party assurance reports that can be provided, penetration testing, a high trust report. Those things are often used in the industry as, as one way to do that. Uh, some organizations distribute questionnaires 
Those are better than nothing. They're not ideal because they don't come with any sort of proof, but uh, in the absence of any other sort of uh, business communication, that's certainly a good first step. We got to have our inventory in order to be able to do that. We got to know where data is flowing so we can hold those third parties accountable. We've got to have a way to govern and make decisions because there are going to be times when we get answers from third parties that we don't like. And we're going to have to decide if the risk of dealing with that third party and the potential cybersecurity issue is worth the benefit of the third party business relationship. And sometimes it is. That's fine. It's okay to make that decision. But we want to make those decisions full knowing the risk and hopefully also with some sort of negotiated agreement that that third party is going to work towards getting better and making improvements in their environment. As you can see for this one, this is one that checks nearly all the boxes. All of these items are important for us to be able to keep tabs on third parties because they are so proliferant in most organizations. So since we talked about third parties, I'm curious to know, does your company have a third party cybersecurity risk management program? Take a second answer. All right, just a couple more mistakes that organizations make here. Um, another one is not having access to the proper security expertise. Many times organizations, smaller organizations who have people wear many hats, they'll look around and go, hey, you're the IT guy, you also do security, or you know, you're the compliance person, you do security. And while it's important that you're purposefully designating someone, you also want to make sure that person has access to appropriate training. They don't have to know everything coming in the door, but you, if, if, if it's not a discipline they've studied in the past, make sure you give them access to training programs or mentors or something where they can fill in gaps in their own knowledge and be able to provide the proper level of security expertise for your organization. Sometimes we see that that's something that organizations set aside. They think once they've named a security person, great, we're good, we'll move on. Their person will take care of it. But you want to make sure if you're going to do that, the person has the competency, has the skill, has the training to be able to do that. And in many cases, you can get that through, tra through outside training, or you can actually leverage third-party relationships and have somebody come in and assist your organization and guide them as like a virtual security leader for a period of time, training and guiding the in-house security person so that he or she can be most successful. All right, checking several boxes there when we do that, as you can see. Uh, monitoring is a big one, obviously, security monitoring, uh, if we don't have access to people to do that, those logs that computers are generating, even if they're telling us bad stuff is happening, nobody's going to be watching, so we're not going to know about it. And ignorance is not an acceptable defense. The courts have shown that a number of times in cybersecurity cases and things like that. So um, we got to make sure that one way or another, we found a way to keep tabs on all those events that are happening in the environment. And then our last mistake is allowing what I'm calling unregulated use of consumer data storage services. And what I mean by this is these are those free cloud services like Dropbox that many of us have for personal use. If we don't tell our employees when it's okay and not okay to use those things, they may set them up to sync automatically and we may end up with sensitive data in those free online sites. And the free versions don't provide any guarantee of cybersecurity. So if the site is compromised in some way, our data could be at risk. So it's really important that you're purposeful about deciding if it's okay to use those online sites like Google Drive and you know, Amazon and Dropbox and Apple iCloud and things like that to store data or not. You need to specifically specify that in your information security policies. And to know if it's a big problem in your organization, you've got to conduct a risk assessment. Okay, so we've made it through 10 common mistakes that organizations make. And I'm curious to know, how many A's did you get? How do you feel like you did as we went through? If you said, hey, I feel like we got this, good for you. Uh, I'm glad for you. I'm glad that the leadership in your organization is clearly invested in and been purposeful about its security program, trying to do the right thing. And that's great. But if you had something where you said, I don't have any idea, or I'm sure we're not doing well on that, maybe you can take the notes from this session back to your IT team, back to your leadership team, and share that with them. And uh, you can use this as a guide for saying, hey, we, we got to raise our game in this. We got to make sure we're doing the right things. 
So back to our agenda for just a second, we've talked about the types of sensitive data that are often at risk. Um, we've got, hopefully now we know 10 security weaknesses, mistakes that organizations make that can lead to security breaches. But I promised you an action plan. And that's what I wanna do now is move towards how do we solve this problem? Great, I get that it's a problem, Mark. How do we move forward? How do we solve for this challenge? Well, the first thing we gotta do is have that inventory of systems and data. You're probably tired of hearing about that by now, but you can see how important it is because we can't protect it if we don't have it on a list, we don't know to manage it. Well, the first step really though is conduct a risk assessment. And a cybersecurity risk assessment, it takes a, a list of threats, bad things that could happen to an organization, and it asks questions and does some analysis to determine the likelihood that that bad thing could be realized by the organization and then the impact to the organization if that threat actually came to fruition, okay? Now, the likelihood that a threat could be realized is, is uh, impacted by the presence or absence of security controls. So if your organization has policies and controls in place, then hopefully your likelihood levels are gonna come down. But that's what a risk assessment does. And it's really important because every organization has a limited number of resources that it can devote to anything, which includes its cybersecurity efforts. So you wanna make sure that you're dedicating your limited number of resources towards that that's gonna have the highest and best return, the biggest risk reduction, the best low hanging fruit, whatever it may be. But that's what that risk assessment is gonna do. It's gonna help you justify, prioritize, and plan for the security issues facing your organization and how you want to address them and how long it may take as well as the investment in people and resources. When you do that, your list of things to do is probably going to include making sure that you are using encryption consistently throughout your environment, both in storage of data when it, whenever possible and in transmission every time it goes across the internet. Really, really important to make sure that encryption is configured so that every time data leaves your company's private network and moves across the internet, you can rest assured that it can't be decrypted, sniffed, or seen by unintended parties. Multi-factor authentication is going to be a key. Now, by now, most of us probably have multi-factor authentication in some capacity in our environments. But what we see a lot when we do penetration testing is sometimes there are portals that were forgotten about, or maybe they were purposefully omitted, things like the Citrix portal, or maybe it's the webmail portal, or the VPN, or something like that that doesn't have the same multi-factor requirement on it that other access points do, remote access points do. And that, if it doesn't have that multi-factor, that is low hanging fruit for a potential attack. And because it is unfortunate that it is so easy to either guess, crack, or find passwords these days, there's a decent chance that if you leave that single factor portal open, it could be compromised. So make sure that all of the internet facing systems have an enforced multi-factor authentication. System hardening is the process of, of turning off services on a computer system that aren't needed and making sure that it's well patched. So you wanna make sure that your IT department is hardening those systems on a regular basis. Vendors regularly publish security issues with their systems and make patches available and security bulletins and things that talk about how to configure systems in a secure way. So it's important to have a hardening process to make sure that your systems are configured securely and that they stay secure as they continue to be used by users over time. Robust security monitoring is really important so that if something is happening in your environment, you're able to identify it and respond and react with the goal of minimizing the impact to the organization. Now, to be able to do that, you've got to have an incident response process. Incident response process is the written way that you're going to respond, as well as an outline of who needs to be involved in the response process. This may include your public relations team. If you have to make some sort of outward acknowledgement of a breach, it's likely going to in include your corporate counsel and your compliance officer and those types of people as well. But you want to make sure you've got a written plan. And not only that, that you've actually simulated a security issue. Because any of us who've lived through a difficult situation know that in the moment, you know, the, the way the human reacts, a lot of times our emotions are really hard to get under control and it may be difficult to think clearly. But if we've practiced our incident response plan in a simulation, 
we're much more familiar with what the expectations are and what our responsibilities are, and we may be able to execute it more effectively than we would if we had to deal with the emotions of the moment. So practicing that instant response plan is really important. Having a third party security program, holding those third parties accountable for actions they're taking on your behalf or with data that they are storing, processing or transmitting for you is gonna be really important. And as I said at the beginning, security policies set management's expectations for users for how they interact with computer systems and handle data on behalf of the company. So we've gotta have a comprehensive set of security policies that outline those expectations and tell IT what needs to be done because those policies basically tell the, the information technology department how to configure the systems, how to operate the environment in a secure way. Without policies, they're left to their own devices and they're gonna make best efforts, but they may not do it exactly the way that you would want them to, or they may not do it the same way every time. And inconsistency is just as bad because that means that some systems leave you with a sense of security because they've been properly handled, but other systems that may have been built by a different person or not following the same process, don't have that same security configuration. And you, and, and you may be naively thinking that, oh my gosh, we're, these are good, but you know, not realizing that those aren't. So it's important to have a comprehensive and communicated security policy set. Once you've done that, you've got to have a way for regularly assessing to determine if the organization, if the controls are operating the way that management intends, if the organization is sufficiently secure. So this involves, this is like an IT audit or a penetration test or some way to keep tabs on, hey, we've made this investment in security. Is it working? Is it having the desired risk reduction? Are we managing our risks effectively? Um, that's important because any investment that we make as a business, we want to know what our return is. So if we're going to make an investment in cybersecurity, we'd like to figure out what the return is. And that's how these assessments give us some indication of the progress we're making towards operating a secure environment and minimizing the security issues. When you're doing this, you may think, man, where do we start? Well, the good news is there are freely available security frameworks out there that anybody can adopt. And there's lots of them. So don't get overwhelmed. Any one of them is a good place to start. They will outline all the things that you need to think about from a security standpoint as you're putting a program together. So there are plenty of baselines out there that can be used, but you should use some sort of framework because the framework has done the thinking. It, it reflects the, uh, the thought leadership of not just one security expert, but hundreds and thousands of security experts over the years, over time around the world that it's, it's evolved so that it really does help any of us think through all of the types of security controls and security issues that need to be managed in an organization. But when you're doing, when you're, when you're using compliance programs, make sure you think of them as the baseline, but not the goal. So you, you certainly need to comply with any compliance obligation you've got from a security standpoint, but don't fall into the trap of saying that once we get compliant, we must be good and moving on. Don't turn your attention away from making sure that you're regularly assessing and managing security risks in your environment. To do all of this, obviously, we've got to have the proper skills and expertise at our disposal. And this involves making sure we've got educated and capable cybersecurity folks available to us to use um, to help guide us in making our decisions as leaders. Okay. So we've made it through our discussion of some security issues that organizations face and a plan on how to address them. And I want to go back for just a second to the very first poll question that we asked. And that is, I asked you at the beginning, how do you feel about your company's cybersecurity efforts? And you had those four options on the screen. Now that we've gone through and we've looked at the report card, the types of things that organizations need to do, answer the question again. Because I'm curious to know if you feel similarly now that you did when we got started. And while you're doing that, I want to share one more thing with you, then I'll be happy to take some questions. In honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, LBMC developed a free downloadable tool that's available for anybody to use who wants to protect their digital identity. And a lot of times when I speak to organizations on cybersecurity, at the end of the talk, they come up and say, hey, thanks for that. That's great. You know, I'll take those tips home and I'll work on my organization. But what about my family? What about my kids? What about my parents? What about those loved ones to me? How do we keep them safe? 
their data is already on the dark web. They're, you know, what do we need to do? Well, we've developed this downloadable asset for you and you can find it in the LBMC exhibitor section of the CVent portal. And if you download that, it's got clickable links that will take you exactly to how to set multi-factor authentication up on all of your social media sites, on Google, on Apple and all of that, so that um, you can make sure that those personal sites that you're using are configured securely. It's also going to send you to a list of password vaults. And I mentioned that it's important to have, uh, you know, password security is important. We got to have different passwords on all of our online sites, because if we don't, if one online site gets compromised, they got our email address when they compromised the, that and they got a password. If we use that same password on our other sites, they can go to other sites, use that email address and password and potentially log in. So it's really important to use a different password on every site but there's no way we can keep up with all those passwords. That's why we use a password vault. So there are links to free password vaults that you and your family can use that will generate secure passwords and keep track of all of them for you. I don't even know what my Facebook password is. It's randomly generated, it's 20 characters long, I know that, but I don't know what it is. The vault keeps up with it. I, keep, I remember one password and that's my vault. I log into my vault and then my vault handles all of my online sites while I'm interacting with my computer during that session. So the next thing you want to do is look at social media. There's some tips and some ways that you can configure Facebook to stop tracking you. Make sure that if you want to use Facebook, that you have some privacy and you can tell it to forget all the data it ever aggregated about you. So if you click on those two links, it'll take you to exactly how to do that. For your home computers, you want to keep them secure. And so you, there's a link that'll take you straight to a list of the 25 things you can do on your Windows computer to make sure that it's secure at home. And there's 10 things you can do on the Mac to do the same thing. Um, and then don't forget about that home router. Most of us have some sort of a, a router in our home these days for wireless access. In many cases, that came directly from whoever provides our internet service. They showed up, they plugged it in. When they left the blinky lights for blinking and we leave it alone now because it works. But that router probably is still configured with default settings. And there are some security issues there. So the downloadable has a link to a free resource that'll tell you how to fix that. And then lastly, keeping an eye on your personal identity is really important. And so there are some tips for how you can make sure that if your identity has been compromised, you're aware of it quickly and how you can reduce the likelihood that your identity could be compromised. So I hope that that'll be useful for you. If you want to download that, share it with your friends. It's for personal use. It's just to help try to raise the collective awareness and help people protect themselves online. So we have a few minutes. I want to hand the floor back to Tiffany. Tiffany, I'll be happy to take any questions that may have come in. Absolutely. We do have a few and be sure to submit any into that Q&A panel and we'll try to get as many answers as we can. Um, first one is how has the pandemic changed cybersecurity issues and considerations? That's a great question. So, you know, I talked about a lot of the, the cybersecurity issues that companies face and the one big difference from the pandemic is many individuals work from home much more frequently than they did previously. And because of that, the data got farther outside the corporate network, and that includes those that may have used personal devices as their home computing device instead of their company-issued computer, but also things like data that's been printed at home. So individuals who might normally have been in an office who would print things, they had access to shred bins that were provided by the office. But people who are working from home during the pandemic may not have had a shred bin. So then you had to think about secure disposal of that data, as well as Maybe both spouses were working at home, and then you're looking at things like sensitive conversations or unlocked computer screens that are displaying sensitive information and those types of things that could be incidentally lead to incidental compromise. So the pandemic has forced cybersecurity professionals to think more about those work from home environments than ever before and make sure that they're thinking through how to provide a secure experience for the user while they're working at home. Next question, how do I know if my company's security program is working? Well, um, that's, a, that, that's a good one. And, and ultimately, what I would tell you is if you have to ask that question, um, it may not be. Hopefully, what's happening is if your company's invested in security, you're getting, as a business leader, some sort of a regular update uh, on how that, how that security program is working. 
Oftentimes it'll be in the form of a dashboard. Sometimes it'll be things like, well, these were the number of attacks we stopped last month, or this is the number of spam email that was filtered, or you know, the number of viruses that we prevented, you know, th things that are measurable. Sometimes it'll be more intangible, but very important. So you should be getting some sort of a regular report from your organization's IT department or your cybersecurity team, if you have dedicated cybersecurity folks that are saying, here's how we're tracking the progress that's being made, and here's evidence of the improvements. And if that isn't happening today, it's important to start asking those questions. And if you don't have a way to do that, another thing you can do is get a third party to come in and do some sort of assessment to give you that validation and at least get a baseline to say, hey, is our security program working? You know, did a penetration test find a way in? Um, you know, did a, did a security audit find that major controls weren't in place or that they weren't functioning the way we expected? So uh, one way or another, you need to make sure that you as a business leader are confident that the efforts that you're endeavoring to do as a company are working. Great. We did have a couple questions come in about third party. Uh, first one, what are basic elements to consider for a third party cybersecurity policy? Well, that's, a, that, that's another very good question. And what I would say is every third party is different. Part of it is going to be um, thinking about the, the nature of the relationship with the third party, um, if data is exchanged, if the third party has access to your environment. But where you want to start is this. What you should do is develop a, a basic set of third party requirements and consider making that a contract addendum when you do business with third parties going forward and just say, these are our expectations for cybersecurity. We're gonna write this into the contract and we're gonna have some sort of a, a provision to hold you accountable for meeting them as well as a penalty if the third party is in violation in some way. And that penalty could be anything from, you know, right to cancel the contract or, you know, some sort of a reduction of fees paid or, you know, anything like that, but some way that you can actually set your expectations with that third party. So the first would be some sort of a contractual outline that says these are what we expect. But then you do have to think about that third party relationship because depending on what the third party does for you, the security expectations, and the specific requirements may be different. For example, if a third party is an application hosting environment, its requirements are gonna be different than say um, a data center that has physical security requirements, those types of things. So. Um, Hopefully that will help you get started in your journey towards third-party security. We had a couple questions come in about uh, the password vaults and if um, these are hacked, will they expose the passwords and is a um, paid password vault more secure than one that would be free? Boy, I tell you what, I have actually spoken, during this month, I've spoken to four different groups and all four groups have asked that question. And it's a really good question about, hey, listen, if I put all my passwords in a vault, isn't that where the bad guy's gonna go? And that's a really good way to think about it. I'm glad you're thinking that way. Here's what I would say is this, um, the commercial vaults. And so the link that we've got there will, will take you to several commercially available vaults. And by the way, they have free versions for consumers. So even the commercial ones that you can pay for, you can get a free version for your personal use. And then if you wanna extend it and have a shared database with your family members or something like that, or have more features available on a mobile device, you know, you can pay them a, 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 a fee. But um, those vaults were specifically designed knowing that they could be a target. And so the organizations have actually segmented the vault. And in some cases, you can tell the organization, I don't want you to keep a copy. I want the only copy and I want it on my computer. And so if you store your copy locally and then you follow the steps to secure your Windows or Mac that are listed there on the, uh, you know, on the downloadable, then you can say, hey, you know what? The only copy is right here. I've got it. I don't have to worry about that third party getting compromised and them getting my vault. But I can tell you that one of the most popular password vault companies was compromised a couple of years ago. And when they were compromised, their entire company was compromised, but none of the vaults were. And it was because they had had the foresight to recognize those vaults needed to be what's called air gapped, completely disconnected from the rest of their environment. So that if they were somehow compromised as a corporation, that, if that vault wouldn't be compromised. So yes, it is a risk. What I would tell you is the risk that you face is one way or another, you gotta keep up with passwords. So you're either gonna have to write them down, choose easy to guess passwords, or um, put them somewhere in an electronic file. And a password vault is the best solution of those options. So um, it's really good that you're thinking that way, but um, you know, it, it, it 
for me personally, a password vault's a really good solution. Well, great. Looks like we're just out of time, but we do have copies of everybody's questions and we'll be reaching out to you um, after this and uh, making sure that if you do want to reach out to Mark, um, you have his contact information and we'll be able to answer any of those additional questions. Great. Thank you very much and stay secure.